Welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us again on uh, another uh, Visual Insights. Um, very lucky uh, for the ones who don't know me. Um, I've been doing sports vision training for the last 20 years. Uh, my history goes back to learning from my father, Dr. Bill Harrison, who started working with uh, baseball players and visual performance skills back in the 70s. And like I said, I've been lucky enough to learn from the best and uh, have continued growing the, the game forward. And one of the persons that he uh, introduced me to, in fact, uh, as a player, I went and did a camp. And on top of that, my brother actually ended up playing for him at one point in his career, but uh, is no, no more than uh, the 2020 ABC and ABCA inductee, Dennis Rogers, who coached at RCC. And I know we got a bunch of RCC guys on here. And so it's, it's great. Uh, Dennis has had me out there with his teams at many times throughout his career, as well as my father. And, and I know they go way back, but uh, I want to, Thank Dennis for joining us. And Dennis, uh, give us a little uh, information about you as a person, uh, you know, your history, where you came from as a coach, as a player, and uh, let some of the people that don't know you know a little bit more. Yeah, we'll do the short version so we can move on. But, um, hey, Dennis, the volume's down again on you. Are we better right there? No. Better? Yep, there we go. We're good now. Okay, stay with me, okay? <laughs> there we go. Um, you know, obviously, I was born in Boston, Massachusetts, migrated to California for family reasons, uh, went to Cal Poly Pomona, played for John Scalinas, uh, and then played a very brief time in professional baseball. When I say brief, I mean brief. <laughs> um, it's more about 175 at-bats, I think that was it. And then I started my coaching career, and then um, that started at the high school level, then the junior college, and then I migrated back to Cal Poly Pomona in 1980 uh, to 83 with coach as his assistant coach. During that time, I was a minor league manager for the Oakland A's in class A, I mean, in rookie ball. And then in 84, I became a full-time member of the Oakland A's managing in AAA and rookie ball and being a coach. And then um, migrated to the Pittsburgh Pirates for two seasons. And then after leaving the Pirates, spent two seasons at Cal State Fullerton as associate head coach and then came to RCC in 1990 and to 2015 with one year interrupted during that time. So uh, basically I've been a, you know, a coach, but more importantly, I've been an instructor as I have been at RCC and Cal Poly and, and Cal State Fullerton during that time. Yeah. You, you great, great experience there. And, and as I know, you know, your experience with John Scalinas was a probably a huge impact in, the beginning of your career and, and, and taking you to another level. Um, can you um, talk a little bit about that with John Scalinas and the experience there? Well, when I went there as a player, you know, um, I'm not downcasting my talents. They were not, you know, they needed uh, enhancing and I psychologically and physically, but once I met him, I knew this was an individual that could provide that environment for people like myself uh, who needed an extra chance and needed more time to develop. Uh, and then I just embedded myself in all the things he believed in, uh, especially the psychological thing. I, I've told people this story. Um, coach used to have meetings on Thursdays during college hour from 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock. These were all pitchers and catchers meetings, psychological meetings. But I remember he introduced Maxwell Maltz, the the book Psycho Cybernetics, and there's yeah. one one thing in there. The nervous system can't tell the difference between a synthetic experience and an actual physical experience. It kind of resonated with me. He went into depth. That meant that I could enhance my skills, not only physically, but I could enhance them psychologically and through visual training and visualization. It took a lot of long time. Uh, and then from there, you know, um, I just believed in what he did because his number one thing was – caring about the human being, educating the person, giving them knowledge, creating habits, never talked about winning. He talked about development. He talked about doing things right uh, and being consistent with, with your approach. Uh, and that's where I kind of lived when I was growing up and I kind of gravitated to that. He was, a, he was a, as knowledgeable a coach as there's ever walked the diamond as far as all aspects of the game. He was one of the first people to introduce the psychological aspect. Uh, when your father came aboard and uh, he was what an enhancer 
to the development of the visual system. He took that daily, the visualization, the ability to see the ball. He became not an expert, but he became a disciple of your father's. And we instituted that not only as me as a player, but as a coach. Um, and during that time, you know, we're in the dark ages of communication. What you have there didn't spread real far uh, because we didn't have the technology we did today. But uh, his imagine, game, imagine that if that if today we had you know the technology with him and what he was doing back then. I mean, he was way ahead of the game than than most people. Most people don't know it. They think everything's new, but it, they were doing the stuff back in the seventies. No, this stuff was resonating. I have I have his practice plans uh, from not only Cal Poly before I ever arrived there or Pepperdine. And uh, they're in the same notebook. He put them in typewritten and I'm going, okay, this is what people were talking about in 2015. And he was writing this in the fifties and sixties, uh, not to the extent that it is now, but I understood the concept. He, he was, constantly engaged in he was a lifetime learner he was constantly engaged in learning he looked at human beings as precious people that he could instruct and develop and create a better life for themselves through their through them being educated through him and he, that was his daily plan every day how can we make somebody better yeah you know I, I was lucky i mean i was pretty young and didn't didn't know too much but you know being around uh cal poly pomona at the time uh running around as a, as a kid. And, you know, I know my dad and John had a, a very good relationship throughout their, their lifetime together. And, um, you know, some great people, uh, you know, obviously you and many other people came out of the Cal Poly Pomona mold and have gone on to do great things. And I think it's a, it's an awesome testament to you that you've been able to carry on that torch and, and expand on that torch and, and leave uh, a lot of coaches that have come out of your RCC program or other programs around you and have done a really good job. So um, it, it's, it's great knowing you, Dennis, but it's phenomenal to see all the, the bloom that has come out of what you've done over there at RCC. Well, I don't take credit for that, honestly. What I do take credit for <laughs> is the fact that um, I believe the people that I came in contact with through my professional career, collegiate career, and junior college career I ran a propaganda business where not only did they play successfully, but I thought they might have a potential to create a life of themselves in the game. Uh, and I always encourage certain people, hey, I think when you're done, you can go into coaching. Uh, I think this is something you can impact. So really, it was really about putting the nugget out there that they could do this. And many of them have not only achieved that, but achieved that at the highest level and really advance not only the game, but their players, the people they've come in contact, created their own vision, which I think is imperative. Yeah, you take a little bit from everybody, yeah. but it's more important they create that. And uh, so I always told players, I create a propaganda. I'm going to bring it up and bring it up, and I think you can do this. And many have gone on to uh, have their moments of excellence, their failures, which we all should <laughs> experience in coaching and have created a life for themselves in the profession that I think has only bettered the profession and made them unique. And I think all of them will have their opportunity to have that moment, whatever that might be. But the moments are more created by who they help. There's That's greater awesome. moments in that than there is in hanging a banner. Though we want to hang a banner, don't get me wrong. <laughs> you know, that's why they do it. They want to win, but they also want to win the human being battle. Yeah, there were a couple of questions that kind of go into this that people had sent in. And one was, I'm going to give you both of them at the same time. Was there a moment in your playing career that you knew you wanted to coach? And then the other is, what or who guided your ethical standard as a coach? And how, do you, how did you navigate your way when it was tested? Um, well, I knew I wanted to play because I never played. In other words, you know, three at bats in three years in Little League, one at bat in Pony League. <laughs> try out for the freshman team. I'm not whining. I'm just saying it's factual. Uh, got cut. Uh, went back to the coach. I see you only got 13 guys. I think come out and do something. Uh, come out. Then eventually I made the – for me it was really my sophomore year in high school when I think I'm just going to focus on playing defense <laughs> and let the hitting take care of itself. And once that happened, I became proficient at it. 
not great, but proficient, and I could play multiple positions. And defense wasn't talked about in those days. And uh, I think that's when I started really paying it. When I was sitting all those years, I was paying attention. I wasn't whining or anything. Uh, but I was paying attention to the game and how coaches manage it, how players play. Because I would go up to some of the friends I had who were exceptional athletes. In our high school team, we had 13 players, and three of them were exceptional, exceptional. And I would just tell them, hey, I think you ought to think about doing this because your skill is this and this. So, And they listened, and they gave me a form and all that. So in that regard, uh, I think I always – and I've been taking care of myself since uh, – uh, we migrated to California. Not that my parents weren't there, but my father became ill. So it was a necessity for me to really take control of my life, educationally, working, skill-wise. And I was very patient with my development. I would never panic over it. I knew who I was at an early age. What's the second part of the question? <laughs> was it uh, what or who guided your ethical standard as a coach and how did you navigate your way when it was tested? Uh, ethical standard really is created by um, the foundation of your upbringing. You know, obviously, uh, my parents, my mother was a, uh, from Italy, hardworking people. My father was uh, on his own at an early age of 12, hardworking man, limited education. But it's pretty simple. You sign up for it. You do the best thing you can, possibly can. You be concerned with other people. Take care of yourself. But uh, don't make it about yourself. And I really, really from my parents, it was really their approach. And I just visually saw that on a daily basis. Now, that shaped me as a person. Ethically, as a baseball person, um, Richard Maris, my high school coach, had tremendous trust in me as far as giving him <laughs> periodical practice plans and suggestions. It wasn't that I was trying to intervene in his territory. I just had suggestions. And that's what I, I meant it at that time. And then obviously coming in contact with Coach Galinas, uh, that was really a game changer as far as um, uh, doing things right. Did I get off the narrow path at times as a young coach? No question. No question. Uh, did I get back on the, his path as I got older? More without question. <laughs> you know, as a young coach, you think you have it figured out. I think the biggest thing that I figured out is if we were going to be successful at that, we needed help. In other words, you cannot do this alone. And the more people I came in contact that influenced me and became part of my staff or I became part of their staff was a bigger impact than the total development of the player. Uh, I always encourage coaches to – have their area of expertise to learn everything humanly possible about the game they could, because at some point they were going to be by themselves. And then they wouldn't feel like they would be by themselves because they would have a knowledge of what's going on. Um, I always encourage that because it's not a simple game. It's a difficult game and it takes precise thinking to get things done and all that. But I think the, I don't like the idea that it's a simple game. It's very difficult. It's yeah. very difficult. So going simple, back to simple but complex. Oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> but we can never underestimate uh, the importance of John Scalinas. I mean, I was impacted by everything. I was impacted by Mr. Harrison, your father. I was impacted by uh, Harvey Dorfman when I was with Oakland on a personal basis. I was impacted by Keith Lithman, minor league director for the Oakland A's. I was impacted by uh, Jim Leland, Sid Thrift. Uh, general manager of the Pittsburgh Pirates with tremendous baseball mind. Carl Keel, uh, many of the collegiate coaches that I watched and and coached against. Uh, yeah, and then more importantly, uh, players. I learned a tremendous amount from professional baseball players that I coach, especially Latin players, on uh, doing things, uh, maybe not lifestyle, but baseball component things, and then learning from your own players. Um, that there's a different way of doing things. And I never liked to. I initially became a coach as a cookie cutter. We're going to do it all this way. And then as I gained more knowledge of the human being, uh, I wanted to spread out. In other words, let them thrive on what they were capable of doing. Give them a little bit of freedom. But I always had this internal belief. I called it the 40-60 rule. 
maybe players would not agree with that. Maybe they thought it was a 90-10 rule. <laughs> but 40% of what we did, we were going to do collectively as a group. This is our belief system. And the other 60 were going to be flexible with their skill development, how they go about it. Uh, I did a lot of that in pro ball and maybe at Cal State Fullerton, maybe a little less at RCC. But as, as we got, as we grew the program and the many people that built the program, uh, I just provided the materials. They built the foundation. I just said, here's the cement. You guys go ahead and build it. And there's many of them uh, who built the foundation and then the structure. And then they decorated it and then they put things inside it. And I think it still stands today. Yeah, I think, you know, a key thing you, you, you talk about, and I think this is good for a lot of coaches out there, is you're constantly learning and, and changing and evolving, uh, you know, based off uh, what you learn from other coaches, what you, you know, learn you don't like and learn what you do like on there. Um, now, you know, speaking about, you know, some of that history, and you may not be able to come up with one, so we may have to skip this, but when you think of uh, Coach Scalinas, you got you to gotta give one of your favorites. What's one story that you can give out there to everyone that was one of your favorites? And I know there's many. Well, there's obviously many. And there, you got to remember, when you put this in context with Coach, very frugal man, okay? Spent money on other people, not himself, okay? Um, this might not resonate with people, but when he was inducted to the ABCA Hall of Fame, it was down in Pittsburgh. OK. And coach wasn't a person who was concerned about awards or recognition. And he really didn't know too many things. I think he knew his religion, his education, his baseball field, his family and stamp usual. He didn't know anything about anything else as far as TV or. But when they introduced him, he met Art Rooney, the owner, the previous owner of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Starting to lose you a little, Dennis. OK. Can you hear me? Yep, yeah, we're good. When they, when they introduced him at the Hall of Fame, they introduced him to Art Rooney, not to repeat myself, uh, who was the owner of the Pittsburgh Steelers, prestigious man. And Coach's comment, you know how Coach always had a slight tilt, he shook hands, and he kind of backslapped everybody to make a point. <laughs> he asked him if he was any release, relationship to the actor Mickey Rooney, because that was his favorite <laughs> actor. And it drew a tremendous amount of laughter. Second story. We're in Houston. I pick him up at LAX. No, I pick him up at his home in Claremont. We're going to the baseball convention in Houston. And uh, I go, Coach, I'll get your bags. We always took that midnight flight to save money. He says, no, I got everything. No, you got an Alpha Beta grocery bag, and you have a briefcase. Yeah, <laughs> that's my travel. You know, a little, little uh, when you traveled in those days, it was a little bit more freedom and all that. Okay, so he had his Alpha Beta bag with his uh, – clothes in in his briefcase with his toiletries and some notes. So we go to the airport, we get to, uh, we get to the hotel, and you know you have to put down a credit card for incidentals. Coach only owned one credit card during the lifetime I knew him, and that was a gas credit card that he rarely used. So he put that down, he goes, I think it was a Chevron card. And the guy, this is like five in the morning or whenever. And he goes, no, sir. He says, it's a credit card. What do you mean? He says, I said, Coach, I'll explain to you later. It's the wrong card in Houston. We got to use a different card. Houston has a different card. He was really ever got perturbed, but he was perturbed about that. That's why I got this credit card so I could use it. <laughs> um, third story. It's not funny, but it's unique. Uh, we're traveling to Hawaii. We always went to Hawaii. Les Morikami was a dear friend of coach at Hawaii, he would take mm -hmm. care of his hotel accommodations and bring him over. But there's two stories here. The first one being coach always carried the meal money in a, in a paper sack, not a briefcase, not in his wallet. No, I mean, and he just held it under his arms. And I always asked him, hey, I can hold that for you. I've got my bag. Anyways, no, I got it, but you dish it out, but I'll hold it. Well, we went to McDonald's and he left it on the table. And as we're departing, and about 10 minutes later, he realizes, I hadn't realized, I'm running back, and Coach is running as fast as I've ever seen this man run, you know, and he had that bad leg. And bottom line is, bottom line is, some gracious human being, a worker there, uh, saw us sitting there, kept the bag, and we got our meal money, which was in excess of a couple thousand dollars at that point, because it was an eight-day stay in Hawaii. 
but the stories are unique and they're all true. And um, uh, the guy showed up when I would be in the office at 6.30 in the morning and he'd show up at seven o'clock. He'd open the door and he'd always salute. John Scalinas reporting for duty. What do you got for me? He'd always be dressed in a tie, ready to teach his 8 a.m. class as obviously he was a professor in his mind more than he was a baseball coach. That's great. Hey, um, speaking of baseball, we're kind of in a weird time right now, and it's probably a lot of things. You know, it's, it's hard uh, for some of these coaches and some of these players to, to know what to do or how to connect. Do you have any thoughts or suggestions of things to be working on right now? Well, uh, mostly suggestions, you know, because uh, it's a difficult time. But more importantly, if you keep it in perspective, and everybody who's probably here understands that, Health is always the driving force behind survival of life in baseball. We want our players to be healthy. We want people to be conscious of where they're at. Baseball will come back. You didn't lose a year. Okay, you lost some time. But I've never believed in that thing, play everything. You know, I believe in the concept, you know, um, treat it like it's your last at bat or your last game. It's very difficult to do for young players or even coaches or anybody because you know it's no truth to it until you get to the end of your career and you go, this might be my last game or I might be released, but they don't think, cause they know they're going to be back on the field tomorrow or practice or some circumstance. That's why I think the biggest emphasis is, you know, be present in the moment, do the best you can. Uh, you might not learn every day, but that's your striving goal. Uh, and keep everything in perspective. But I think boy, more than ever, is my belief that if coaches, uh, players are not psychologically engaged in all the aspects, creating mental clarity, uh, working on their visual uh, ability, uh, breathing patterns, uh, trust in themselves, whether it's reading or watching videos or just them spending time with themselves and understanding what a great thing because then you could go right back in when training takes place, let's say at the professional level, which will probably be only major league baseball, maybe late in the summer, they can do things. And then they will be that much farther ahead of the game. Well, I'm not, my body's not ready. Cause you know, they're taking care of their bodies, but if you're not taking care of your mind, uh, your body can only do so much for you. And I think that's the value of coaching today. I know it's very difficult, but the coaches who really stand out isn't the, the guy the ability to create a pitching pattern. I believe in all those stuff, analytical stuff. I think it's great. But the guy who can go and help a player perform at his highest level psychologically with his given skills and see improvement, boy, those are outliers. And there's very few of them. Uh, not that they don't want it. The job becomes demanding. Trying to again, lose you again. There we go. The job becomes demanding. Uh, is that better? Yeah. My apologies. But remember, it's all about the player. And that's why we got in coaching. You know, the wins are the wins, but the more the player can be enhanced uh, daily uh, is going to make it better. And then failure in baseball is, is constant. How do we overcome that during the course of a game, during the course of uh, a season, a week and all that? I think those are – Man, if I could go back, <laughs> uh, I think all our coaches should be trained in that area. But I would have somebody on staff that could teach all those aspects so we could learn. The more we spend a lot of time teaching players, but we don't spend a lot of time teaching our staff because they're the key component to making the players better. Yeah, I know, you know, my experience with my dad, too, is, um, you know, the more that the staff's involved with what we train and from a visual performance and get involved, the players – and the team are so much better off in the long run. So it, I think that's an important factor of making sure everyone's involved. And, and it's a great time right now to work on the mental visual side of the game. Well, I know. I don't Lost know. your volume again. Okay. I don't know what coaches are doing, but if they're doing zoom meetings, they should be with their teams, the first 10 or 15 minutes, some psychological training or things they can work on on their own, because we want players to take ownership of their careers. We want them to be accountable. Why not add it to them uh, that these things are imperative when I, when I see you come back, but you know what? We stress so much the physical aspect, which is a necessity, 
But if we're not utilizing the psychological advantages that players have and coaches have, uh, we're just blowing in the wind. Yeah, you know, Dennis, that brings a, up a good point. I, we had a, an earlier conversation with Craig Snyder of, at Texas A&M uh, a few weeks back, and he was talking about his players in this offseason and, you know, giving them some time to rest. And one of the homeworks that he gave them uh, was kind of on the line of what you're talking about. And something you and I just talked about was he, their homework was to watch uh, Alex Hanald's uh, climbing thing of, uh, what was that called? Uh, Free, free, solo. free solo, free solo. And, <laughs> and you were, as we talked earlier, and I remember this back um, years ago, you telling me about him is you brought him in to come talk to your team. And uh, you, it was a very enlightening moment for you as well as your team. I don't know if you want to, to, to add to that. Well, when I saw his um... lost your volume again, can you hear me now? Uh, not no. good. Yep. We're good. Okay, when I saw him on 60 Minutes doing his presentation of uh, climbing Half Dome, and he was scripting it from a great distance with the commentator, this is where I'm going to place my foot, this is where I'm going to place my hand. I had known about him through my daughter. She was up at Yosemite working at that time uh, and was a climber. And I go, oh boy, this is different because I always believe some of the answers of baseball are not in baseball. They're outside of baseball. So when I saw that and I called her and I go, okay, I'm going to leave in two days. I'm going to head up there. We're going to find this MF. <laughs> in other words, this is as good as I've seen. Anyways, we went up there and we scoured the countryside for him at Yosemite. He was climbing that time. Didn't find him. Couldn't locate the white van. Uh, bottom line is, about a week later, she found his van and left a note on it that my father is a teacher, he's a baseball coach, would like to, you know, have contact with you to visit with his team and talk. Anyways, he emailed me. Uh, through that email, uh, we set up a time for him to come down. The only contingent, I paid him, I paid him $1,000. I thought it was well worth it for the experience of our coaches and our players. Uh, we went to a climbing gym initially to learn about some of the things. Uh, that he was going through, but he wanted to climb down at the rock far in down in Rubido before he did come. And he brought his van. He brought his girlfriend, who was a nurse at that time, and he made a presentation. Um, he was just, it's the first time he had told me he ever spoke in front of a large group. But one question that did come up was the fact that I think a player, I can't recall who asked her, one of the coaches, he says, well, guy, I find it so difficult that you have to repeat a pitch. I don't think I could do that. I have to throw another one uh, with high intensity and focus and have a purpose. And somebody says, well, Alex, if, if you fall, you die. I don't give it much thought. I think that was his response. Obviously, with his years of training and all that, then the movie came out. And my daughter, Brittany, uh, knows – doesn't know him well, but has been with them, the producers um, and the filmmakers and all that, and followed Alex. But what it did is, if you saw, if we just focus on the athletic aspect of it, not the personal and the emotional thing with it, uh, he had a driven purpose, and he was calculating, but he was precise in detail on how he was going to accomplish this. He knew himself very well, because as you remember in the movie, he backed away and didn't go back for many months until he did it. But he didn't have this fear because part of it was rehearsal. And I think you heard some of the psychological things he did. He didn't want any distractions. Now, all those things pertain to baseball. Uh, but I think his perseverance and his detail, we all want that, but do we really inspire to do that on a daily basis, you know, as coaches, as players, as whatever occupation we're in. But I think the movie kind of elevated. People thought he was, you know, a little self-indulgent. That isn't what the movie was about. The movie was about somebody executing something at the highest level that nobody had ever done before. Yeah. Uh, and his preparation. Doing... Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Uh, and, you know, what, one of the things we talked about and, you know, even goes back to, to Coach Scalinas and back to my dad is really about the visualization and the visual process that it takes of, uh, and you kind of said it's a rehearsal of doing that. And, you know, I know uh, you're a big believer in that. And I think in, in your players that you've had over the career, 
Would you say a lot of it, those better players are pretty good visualizers? Well, I wish I could address that. I know that when I initially introduced this, when I left Cal Poly, you know, and, and started implementing this in all my programs, um, I could have done it maybe a little bit better because I used to, now I've gotten away from it because I don't coach, but, you know, just having them lay down and close their eyes and get a clearer picture. Um, I changed that a little bit in uh, professional baseball, but I was really hoping the players would, I wasn't trying to give, make them do it. I was trying to introduce them to let them be part of that. Bobby Starting Shelby, to lose you a little bit, Dennis. Can't hear you. Yeah. No? A little, little bit. Okay, bear with me for a second. <laughs> there we go. Are we better? Yeah, we're better again. Okay. Uh, Bobby Kelty, I remember when he was a player, used to say, okay, we're going to take – okay, Dennis wants us to lay on the ground for eight minutes and clear our mind. <laughs> uh, what is this about? <laughs> okay. Well, the bottom line is, and I always told players, uh, you can either impact yourself and do it because it's an individual exercise, or you can take a great eight-minute nap, and then we'll get started with our regular routine and all that. But then Bobby uh, played Major League Baseball for seven years, and I think his last at bat in professional baseball, he hit a home run for the Boston Red Sox against the Colorado Rockies to seal the fourth game of their championship season, but he had faced uh, this pitcher numerous times, Fuentes, left-handed pitcher. And he addresses this too, where he knew the only time he was going to hit in the World Series was probably against him. And he had faced him numerous times in the minor leagues and professional baseball. And he always started off with a high fastball. And he says for, four, for many days prior to that at bat, he had visualized facing plays, getting the fastball up in the zone and taking off and letting it rip. And he says, if that happens, if he throws me that pitch, I'm going. But he had said that he had visualized and seen that 200 times, maybe in the course of that day before the game. Ironically, fastball elevated up in the zone. He takes a swing at it, obviously a home run. Uh, so the power of it, you just don't know when it's going to happen. The thing is, you make it part of your daily routine. Everybody wants instantaneous feedback and results, okay? If you can understand the detail and the time it takes, if you make it part of your routine, it becomes clearer and more driven, and then clarity starts happening, and then you can utilize it at the moment. In other words, at an at-bat, at a pitch, at a uh, ground ball. You don't have to wait uh, and do it after the game or before the game. It just bec becomes part of your mental training that if you're fortunate to play that long, but you can do it as a coach. You can do that because you do, you do visually go over a whole game with the players you're going to have play. I used to do that uh, and then got away from it. But I think uh, the training is essential towards one uh, personal development. Now, now, I remember as a kid playing uh, Little League and my dad's, you know, helping out coaching. And he's got us out in right field all laying on the ground eyes closed. I'm thinking my dad is nuts. What the heck is my dad doing? He's embarrassing me in front of my friends. I can't believe him. I'm pissed. On there. And then I realized, man, this stuff works. It's kind of cool. And it's funny today. I get a lot of uh, um, response from players, uh, friends of mine that played and said, man, your dad had me visualize and that thing was so great. Uh, it, it's helped me so much. So it, sometimes it's hard for us beginners to know what we're doing, but the power of it and uh, it should be a part of everyone's daily, you know, journey. And right now is a great time when you can't get on the field is to be picturing, you know, how you're going to go back and play, how you're going to swing, how you're going to hit against this guy, how you're going to make plays to your left, how, how you can make plays to your right. So it, it is a great opportunity that um, I don't think people talk about enough. Well, they don't, they, you know, we give it more lip service than we do anything. Let's be honest about it. We're more physically driven towards repetition on skills uh, and that's good, but we can break it up. I mean, just think if you started your practices. We used to try to do, I used to do the 12-minute thing. But just think if you started or, or did it three times a week of whatever mental training, visual training, breathing, how it could utilize your personal life first and then your athletic life. Uh, because you're going to live more in your life than you are playing a particular sport and everything. 
and it can enhance so many different things. And as you learn about it and develop it, that enhances the players, which we should be player driven anyways. Yeah. Now I kind of uh, joke around in a not, not nice way necessarily, but visualization is visual and it's not mental. It's about creating pictures. And so learning how to visualize, which affects the mental, they all, they all combine in, in reality. But, you know, that's kind of when you, you talk about lip service, that's one thing about vision training. So many people give it lip service instead of really doing something to get their eyes functioning properly. And as you know, people say, watch the ball. Okay, that doesn't do much. Or look at it, that doesn't do much. You know, we kind of maybe give a little bit of a background with you and my dad and understand the importance of vision uh, played a role at, at Pomona to Riverside Community to other pl pro players that you've seen? Well, when I was first introduced to your father's teachings, uh, I didn't ask many questions. I paid attention and wrote a lot of notes. It wasn't my place because as I was learning about it, and then as me and Bill and your father became friends, and I think probably I gathered the most knowledge when we were both with the Pittsburgh Pirates. And we came aboard simultaneously when Sid Thrift took over. Within a month, we were both aboard. And then obviously your dad being in the spring training and working with players and coaches, I saw the resistance. For, even though Sid was running the show and said, this is what we're doing, I saw the resistance of coaches and staff that said, "This we just play baseball. We ain't going to do this. Uh, so I had my obstacles to, you know, penetrate and add that to players when staff didn't believe in it even though Sid did he just expected us to get it done but that's when I really became empowered with the knowledge that your father had and the influence he had on players and I know he had many influences prior to that experience with the Pirates and then we went to the International Academy in Wichita where um, uh, he implemented that with players from all over the world with some prestigious coaches there and that's when I started, okay, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to start implementing this on my programs as well. And not the level your father and yourself have done it, but a level that at least we can stay with it on a regular basis uh, and continue to do it, which should be essential today. If your father had evolved today, uh, the impact would be greater. But during that time when he did, we couldn't get the message out. You know, uh, it was really word of mouth and everything. But all I know is players improve. The ones that gravitated to it, utilized it, and players improve uh, on a regular basis. His impact on the game is underestimated, what your father was able to do. And the ones who, if we're still doing it, the ones who believe in it, then the impact is even greater. Yeah, it, it takes a lot. You know, I mean, you got to, as a coach, as you know, you have to believe in it and you have to do it daily and, and add it as part of their practice plan. But, um, you know, obviously seeing the ball and you got to be physical, you got to be mental, but you, you definitely got to be visual and know, know how to see that thing to make it a little bit easier. Well, you got to be able to see everything. We live our life, you know, visually. Um, so if it's that important, but it means, do you have the self-discipline, the detail, okay? The detail to willing to put the work in and – etch out that X amount of time to do that work on a daily basis after you've been given a directive. And then you can, you know, talk to somebody who can enhance and maybe um, express it. I've talked to uh, some players at other universities and, and they said, guy, once I had the visual guy come in, not your father, somebody else, I said, what did he have you do? Man, it just changed us. You know, we laid on the ground, we did, you know, this. I said, then who picked it up after that? No, I did as a player. I would do it with the, with the uh, other players. Somebody told me that. Uh, it doesn't matter how it gets done, but uh, it's not a baseball skill. It's a life skill. See, people yeah. miss – it's not a baseball skill. It can enhance everything you do uh, as life gets more difficult and complicated. The question that someone had asked, um, how do you help players who lack confidence in their abilities? It's a big question. Oh, no, it's a huge question. Um, I don't really uh, – first of all, uh, these are just suggestions. Make sure your audience understands that. I'm not an absolute on things. Um, well, it's another tool all, in the tool belt. Everyone needs – Well, yeah, box. but we need a big toolbox when you have yeah. those questions. Uh, yeah. It takes time, number one. It's really about the, the coach or the person engaging with that player. 
and finding out how they think and why they think and who they are and all that and giving them building blocks that are very slow developing but they have some foundation behind them because everybody lacks confidence you know it's really not so much confidence as trust in their beliefs to get better because what they do is verbalize they're good at something but internally and I'm not a big heart guy. I'm a big soul guy. Deep in their soul, they just don't have that trust and everything. Support them during failures. Um, I, think, I think it really comes down to the individual and how the coach wants to penetrate uh, his inner being and teach him and give them chances to be successful and fail and give them another chance and all that. It's, it's really an open-end question. It's, it's almost like you like – I think you as a – let me just add one thing to that. Mm-hmm. I think how you, you as a coach and your staff go about your daily business builds a little bit of trust and confidence. What you're trying to establish with each individual player and collectively as a team, they start by building those blocks. Uh, so it's really about the personality of the coach uh, and the directive he or she wants to create. Yeah, it, it's a yeah, it's a vague answer. It's a very vague answer. Well, I think you you said something that's key, and we talked about this in one of our last sessions: is asking questions. You got to ask questions to find out, you know, the right solution. And um, you know, it, it it takes all those tools to to find out a way to help someone with their confidence. Is their confidence broken down because something's going on at home? Or is their confidence broken down because of some of the teammates? Is it because of the coach? You know, there's there's so many reasons why their confidence can be down, or they're afraid, and finding that. Uh, that mechanism to, to create that confidence may be a, a trial and, and an error situation until you find the right solution for it. Well, you know, we can, uh, I've always kind of believed uh, lately, I got this information from other people, but number one, no matter who the player is, what his or her background are, they want to know, do you care? Do you care? Number two, do, do you have information that you can impart to me over a period of time that can help my individual growth today and long term? And can I trust you? Well, I've also told players those are the three things the coaches want from the players. Do you care about the game enough and improving yourself that you're going to take our directive? Will you trust our knowledge and utilize it to the best of your ability to enhance your skills? And will you tr- trust that the environment we, qu- we create can make you that much better as a person, as a player. You know, there's many components, but I think those three things are essentials because once you have the player's trust, he is open to information, but more, he's also open to productive criticism and a directive that can lead him off the wrong, the path and put him back on the road correctly with some stimulation. Yeah, no question. Yeah, that's awesome. That's great. Uh, one of the questions also here is why did why did you call Coach Scalina's coach, but all your players call you Dennis? I was never wrapped up in a game <laughs> in my name. You know, let's be honest. Uh, 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 I wasn't I wasn't okay. Some I said you can call me Coach, you can call me Mister Rogers, you can call me Dennis. But I also told the players, and I excused my your former. Hey, wait a minute! Your players are, are disagreeing with you right now. Oh, really? You made him call Dennis. Oh, they said I made them call him Dennis? Well, yeah, because I, I said, okay, uh, coach, and I said, well, I'm not going to call you player Ryan or player <laughs> Joe. I'm going to call you by your name. But I used to tell the players this, and excuse my uh, – but I said, when you guys get together and you collectively talk about the coaches, especially me, and you blast me for uh, my incompetence or your lack of playing time, Please do it with deep in your soul emotion. Don't call me F. Call me MF with directive <laughs> determination so that word penetrates. And I can feel that from a great distance. Be committed to the word. There's truth in that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's funny. I see a lot of guys laughing right now because they, they remember those times with you. And I know uh, there's – if I had them all on right now, they'd probably tell you some everyone some great stories about you as a coach. Uh, well, maybe ones you don't, you may not want them to tell, but good stories. Well, there, there, there's many stories when you're the kind of you're one of the voices. Uh, 
everybody gets to pick and choose what they want. And I'm fine with it because uh, if it happened, it's all true. So I'm not going to run from it. <laughs> but um, uh, I could tell you, as if you lined everybody up, I got a story about everybody too, you know? It yeah. would bring laughter. It would bring laughter at this point. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, now, your time at RCC, um, what were some of your greatest moments? Uh, and I know you won some championships there, uh, but you know, I assume that's not your greatest moment uh, based off things you said, but what are some of the, some great things that happened uh, at RCC that, that really resonate with you? You know, um, and I've never really been a moment guy. <laughs> In other words, this moment, and it's hard for me to recall names and, you know, because of the aging factor. But, uh, you know, I think the unique thing about coaching at the junior college is everything changes from year to year. Every year was different than the previous year because you would have continuity very little because some guys would return. Some guys would move on very quickly. More importantly was building a foundation that there was a belief initially probably, you know, you need the first team to have the 20th team. You need the first team to have the end of the, my career. And I think the people that came in initially and gravitated to the foundation we, that was built uh, that started the program, we became a pitching and defense type of school. We thought that would be the quickest way to enhance players' development and get them the next opportunity, uh, as well as hitting. But those were the two parallels. And then doing things maybe um, – a little bit more discipline than other programs so we could market it. It was all about marketing our player where, but they built the foundation. So the greatest moments of the initial years where those teams had success, personalities developed, and that created all the other years and everything. Um, I had the unique ability of coaching some unique people, uh, uh, different than many. They're all unique in their own ways, but they've all gone on to create lives as fathers, as husbands, running businesses, assisting and coaching, creating coaching opportunities, inspiring other people. Uh, Coach Galinas' biggest thing was influence. And I think the environment influenced them. And now they're having that opportunity. Winning the championships always is great. There's no question. They're great moments. But I always wanted to win the people championship because I rarely look at banners. I look at people and go, okay, this guy created this. Um, there were some great moments, even when we lost. In other words, the opportunity to be at a state final or a championship game. Uh, but they had great moments in their career. More importantly, uh, did they get inspired by baseball? Did baseball give them an opportunity to elevate their lives, uh, give them an opportunity because um, – to really believe in themselves and make the game a little bit better. I think our guys, all the players, many of them, and many of the guys in coaching in many different uh, as, uh, aspects uh, have enhanced the game. They've enhanced their players. They've created great uh, environments, and they're all unique in their own way. I mean, I, I go back, you know, I don't never like to single out a player, but I do from this standpoint. I go back to Mike Ashman. Mike Ashman played for me longer than any human being. He played two years at San Bernardino Valley, was an All-American. Played two years at Cal Poly Pomona, uh, was an All-American, and probably the most key guy of us winning a national championship. Went into professional baseball. Uh, the only guy in Baseball Hall of Fame that played 10 positions in the minor leagues in Albany with the Oakland A's. When I was the farm director for three weeks, as you remember, Buzzy Keller, uh, mm. I traded for Mike Ashman from the Oakland A's. He played for me for two weeks, and then they took him away. And, you know, Mike went on to come to Cal Poly, excuse me, to RCC as a coach, then to Nebraska, then carried on coach's legacy at Cal Poly. And he's still involved in the game impactfully, uh, um, you know, with the California Angels. Um, I mean, he was he was as good as, as good – a performer in the moments you needed it than players I've ever been around. And I've had, I've had the fortunate ability of having many of them, but um, uh, our relationship goes way back, you know, to, to really when I started my coaching career. Yeah. Uh, here's a question. What's your motto you share with your players and your coaches? Oh, it's an open-end question. I, I don't have one <laughs> motto. 
I'm not a t-shirt guy. What I mean is put a bunch of slogans on it. You know what I mean? Or, um, I could come up with, uh, I could come up with hundreds of models. Um, the simplest one is if given where I'm at today would be, you know, creating consistent habits that allow you the opportunity to grow, but more importantly, to adjust to given circumstances immediately and to focus on how you're going to overcome the momentary failures you have. Those are my models. I'm a big soul person, man. You know, I've always told the players and coaches, um, you know, when they come to RCC, um, they like the sport. They don't love the sport. Uh, it's really a hobby when they come. They might tell you differently, but if we can get them to the like stage, then when they leave, maybe they can love the game and the things to go with the game, the work ethic, the approach, everything. They don't get they get they start maybe get the L when they're at RCC, but the OVE comes later on, and then they gain a passion after they've done it for a long period of time. But they don't give it second thought. They know exactly what needs to be done. They overcome adversity. They're consistent when they're successful and understand it's momentarily. Uh, they don't gravitate to it and talk about it. Uh, but it takes a long time to gain passion. I've never been a fan of, hey, I've got passion. Well, great. What's, what's your passion? Mm, no, that isn't it. You're a hobby-like person. As many people <laughs> are in the profession, not only baseball, but, you know, in other professions too. Words do not get fooled by words, but you never get fooled by action. You can be fooled by words, uh, but not by action. Great. Now, um, just some, some other thoughts as we start wrapping this up a little bit here. Um, if I were a, an infielder, um, you have any suggestions um, on something I should be working on, whether we're in this uh, quarantine time or non-quarantine time? Do you have any suggestions for me as an infielder? Well, as an infielder, um, if you're trying to be a professional infielder, the odds are going to be cut against you because the Latin American market is not going away. <laughs> so they're, they're going to, you know, as they infiltrated Major League Baseball and all that, um, you know, that's, again, another open-end question. I mean, consistency with your approach. In other words, it's got to start with throwing before you become an infielder, how you throw the baseball consistently. Because if you can't throw it uh, consistently, it's going to be difficult for you to play other than a locked-in position at second base. The throwing mechanics, the body function, um, using your hands and your feet simultaneously, um, clearing your mind, speed of ball. Um, there's, there's many, many things you can do, but you have to start with the basic things, and there has to be tremendous repetition, repetition over a short period of time. Uh, I've always believed that – I've never believed in that 100 ground ball theory. In other words, let's hit him 100 ground balls and it will get better. That is ridiculous from the standpoint. Um, High-quality ground balls, different styles, different hops and all that. Let them back off because the game doesn't play that game. An infielder might not get a ball for four innings, and then he gets rapid fired. Um, I think training the whole body and breaking it down to I've – had, I've had some really, really – quality players and coaches in professional baseball in college that have become outstanding infill instructors, uh, much more knowledgeable than I am. They've added to what I gave them and really took, made it a novel instead of a book uh, and can really enhance that. The same with other guys who have taught catching and pitching is pitching, especially we've got some unique guys and uh, out there who are uh, transforming the game from the pitching aspect of it. Uh, but to answer your question, and I did a poor job, throwing mechanics are essential to becoming a successful infielder. Footwork and hand skills, direction of your body, reading the hop, understanding how the speed of the ball, playing multiple positions, taking the ball off the bat, and not taking any days off, but making your, your quality work 15, 20 minutes a day with precise detail and some assistance, you'll get better at it. You know, I think uh, one thing uh, I like, Dennis, is, you know, and I'm not, you know, obviously the, the baseball coach, but I'm a vision coach, but, you know, everyone wants to throw in all the knowledge as, as quickly as possible. They want to give them that novel right away. And, you know, you, you, I think you bring up a good point is you got to give them the book first and then let the novel, you know, kind of evolve as time gets there and, and they get, you know, they start learning more, they start adding more to it. Um, 
you know, and I think that's something that's going on, especially in hitting today, is we want these young hitters to be Mike Trout tomorrow instead of realizing Mike Trout wasn't Mike Trout at 12 years old. <laughs> it takes time and takes, it takes experience and takes a um, depth of knowledge to, to get their game to a very high level. And I'm going to add one more thing to you. Uh, you had a player that I'm familiar with is Greg Dobbs, who was a very great infielder in the big leagues that came out of your program. Um, and I know he's, he learned a lot from you. I know if he was on, he'd say that to you. And, and he's evolved tremendously as he got older as well. Yeah, Greg was, uh, Greg was uh, a unique player. In other words, he was a prolific hitter, even as a young kid, as he went through high school and, uh, you know, travel ball and RCC. He was a great hitter when he showed up at RCC. Uh, Brian Green had an impact on him. Uh, I did very little to change his swing because he was pretty astute on what he wanted to do. Now, I was a little demanding on him defensively uh, <laughs> as a third baseman. But then as he got older, as all good players do, they understand the value of playing quality defense and how important it was for them to get into a lineup and succeed when their, you know, offensive games would struggle. So he, could be, he made himself a complete player. You know, he was a pretty prolific player, played a long time in the major leagues, had a clear mind about trust and belief in himself. One of the big things, he had tremendous belief in himself. At RCC, Bobby Kelty was his father. OK. Yeah. <laughs> and Greg would, you know, Bobby would take care of him when he was there during the time because they were close. They went to high school together. Yeah. Well, yeah, you had some uh, definitely some great players come out of RCC. It was always fun for my father and I when we were out on the road, work with a pro team. And they'd say, oh, yeah, we, went to, we played for RCC. We played for Dennis, you know, and it was always fun to run into those guys. And then on top of it, you've had a lot of coaches come out from uh, – under your program and doing really well. And I know there's guys on here. Uh, in fact, I just looked up and I saw Ben Rosenthal's names up there who played with my brother and now with the Astros. And we got Chris Hernandez on there. We see him right there. Uh, but a bunch of coaches out of there. Anything you want to say to your former players and uh, former coaches that are, um, that are on? No, um, you know, from this standpoint, obviously I don't get to visit with these guys a lot. And, you know, one of my, you know, People have told me I'm wrong, but I'm not going to change at this point. I don't invade too many people's territory, you know, as far as coaching. You know, um, I've always had this belief, you know, um, you know, when they're at the field, that's their place of employment. You leave them alone. You could talk to them after the game or call them or see them on a private, you know, uh, get together. But that's their place of employment. I never had a problem with people coming and interrupting. But for these people, I didn't want to be that guy who was, hey, you know, I know it's the third inning. Let's talk, you know, and some guys will. Um, but I think everybody's, everybody's approach to the game is different. But when do they get to the point when they really, really uh, have changed the direction of their teaching and everything? You know, two guys you, you've mentioned, uh, you know, Ben Rosenthal was grinding it for a long time until – he got into professional baseball and he had great knowledge and an organization found that knowledge and elevated him very quickly. Chris Hernandez played for championship teams, his elevated pitchers and all that. And there's many there, but I truly believe that they continue their growth uh, and not think about what they're not getting, but what they're giving and what the future can be. They all have chances to elevate themselves. You're going to see many names surface and have, even though many of them have had, uh, outstanding careers as coaches and uh, have elevated players. They're going to continue to grow. Um, and the game needs these people in it to inspire young players and organizations and give them directives and all that. And there's guys who are not even in the game who could do that, but they've chosen other occupations and all that. I haven't been able to get my propaganda to them. Uh, <laughs> but um, I think you can elevate teams and players through a consistent approach of information on a daily basis, make it about them, keep training them, inspire them to dig a little deeper for the mental uh, growth, obviously the physical, take every moment and make it count. And when it doesn't count, readjust to it, everything, and have them influence other people. Because leadership is really the foot, footsteps behind you. It's not the person in front as it is the people beside you. Yeah. Well, Dennis, I appreciate it. And I know um, 
a lot of these uh, people that are on appreciate your time. Um, you know, I, I was lucky enough to uh, see you at ABCA this year, and um, you got a lot of, you know, congratulations again on be, being inducted to the Hall of Fame. It's, it's, uh, you deserve it, whether you agree with it or not, you deserve it <laughs> tremendously. And I know your coaches, former coaches and players all agree with you on that as well. Um, with that, is there anything you want to add or any quest, anything you want to put out there? Um, no, not really. You know, I appreciate all the kind thoughts. I uh, obviously appreciate the kindness of people showing up and coming to the Hall of Fame. Uh, I didn't know that many people would come, and I appreciate, you know, their love in that regard. Uh, because I always believe this, uh, they're foundation builders. They're the ones who built this foundation at Riverside, and they contributed to other foundations uh, that were built and all that. I would just hope that they trust themselves and keep their vision on developing and adding to their game on a regular basis and, and really say the words they believe in to the organizations or, or programs. Because at the end of the day, Coach always used to tell me, uh, you know, it's not about the wins because he always says, Coach, you're the greatest uh, Division II winning coach of all time. And I remember him on stage saying, I've also lost the most games in Division II. <laughs> and you can't take them with you. What are you going to do with them? But people can be enhanced. Winning is a result of a collective effort of a group of people with some individuals standing out more than others. But the bottom line is if you win the human battle, okay, and they go on and inspire other people in the game, because we need people to influence the game and the approach and all that. And sometimes you have to take a step back for your own personal gain to have somebody ahead of you gain something. You'll gain something. If you stay in this game long enough and you're good, you're going to be recognized in some form. However it might be, you're going to be recognized for the right reasons. Not because you've won a couple of thousand games, because of the right reasons and all that. So I appreciate everything that everybody's done, especially yourself. Uh, and your father's obviously is deep in my soul, as I don't want to cry. But. <laughs> we've, we've got through it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's definitely, yeah. I'll lose it for a minute. <laughs> Tough time, obviously. And Dennis, you mean a lot to me and the family, and I appreciate that. And, um, <laughs> We'll keep pushing the, pushing the, you know, the envelope down the road and hopefully we can get some great content out there. And I hope that, you know, you enjoy your time off, but I also hope that you keep uh, educating people with your knowledge because you have a lot of knowledge that's very worthy out to a lot of coaches, players, and, and people out there. So, um, you know, if I may say one last thought, it has nothing to do with our discussion, but obviously, uh, you know, uh, all the coaches are all people and it's not an advertisement. The Michael Jordan documentary, yeah. uh, watch it. Not because of Michael Jordan, you're going to find the unique person, but you're all in coaching. Watch what Phil Jackson did. He does not get the acclaim. He justly deserves. People mm -hmm. think it's real easy coaching marquee athletes than it is inefficient athletes. It's a very difficult task, but you saw him bring the, Indian culture, uh, the meditation, all those things when those weren't glamorous ideas, but really giving players voices and all that. Um, I think it's good. I think it be, could be unique as far as people understanding there is a different way to coach uh, yeah. and there's other ways and, and it can maybe enhance their knowledge and everything. Anyways, well, thank Ryan, you. For your Ryan Rasmussen had posted a, a while earlier that you are the Phil Jackson of baseball on there well uh phil jackson in this regard we both um uh, if you watch the thing uh, he went to great falls montana to start <laughs> this is where his cabin is and all that uh i played in great falls montana that was a unique thing about watching it um no ryan rasmussen got to remember though if we're going to if we're going to tell stories ryan rasmussen <laughs> hit 404 with only nine fingers he had one finger that couldn't move. He decided to play. We wrapped up the bat. He played first base, led us to a state championship with some other guys, then went to UCLA and uh, became um, a Pac-10 second baseman. And then um, after he took a two-year mission, and then he came back. But uh, you would never think he, his personality uh, would be, yeah, I'll, I'll just tape it up and here we go. We'll play with nine fingers, one finger off the bat. <laughs> so uh, awesome. love him for that. There's, like I said, there's a story about everybody. Yeah.
That's awesome. Well, again, Dennis, thank you guys. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, we'll be doing more of these. We have a sports vision uh, from the U.S. Air Force Academy on Wednesday. I have a long-range shooter on Friday that uh, trains um, snipers right now in, out of uh, Texas. It's a phenomenal uh, story about him. And we also have some baseball people coming in, including Dusty Wathen and Reggie uh, Smith are coming on in the next couple of weeks as well. So uh, thank Max BP and NDV Performance for uh, help, helping us put this together. And if you guys have any questions or concerns or uh, thoughts to give uh, Dennis or myself, please uh, reach out to us and uh, we'll, uh, we'll respond as soon as we can. So again, thank you guys. And um, Okay, great. everybody be safe. Keep your social distance. It all get, we'll all recover, but don't, don't jump the gun. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Dennis.